Um, so let's transition. This is great stuff. Let's transition to this next one. You know, when you think about security, uh, you know, of in this is security of uh, communications links, satellite, IoT. But think about the security and safety of cultural resources. And that's really what Carla's article brings up. You know, this conflict in the Ukraine is, is not the first uh, where cultural items of world and global significance have been targeted uh, for destruction, which is, by the way, as she notes in this article we're going to show here in a second, uh, is completely against international law. We'll get into that a little bit more here. But Carla, could you tell us a little bit about your article? Sure. So um, just broadly at uh, Geo Week, we talk a lot about reality capture and some of the applications for capturing things in 3D that can give you more information than, say, a static floor plan or, or an architectural model. So we, we follow use cases um, a lot, you know, in a lot of different industries. And we've covered some things about cultural heritage before, but usually they're in an academic sense, like, OK, we discovered some ruins somewhere. We'll take 15 years and we'll go study this, you know, extensively here we kind of have a story that's that's on a incredibly short dangerous time scale it's it's folks on the ground in uk ukraine that started their own re reality capture company you know before before the conflict uh began and applied what they were doing applied the techniques that they learned to come in and out of their cultural heritage sites that are churches and other monuments and try to capture them in as much detail as they can in as quick a way as possible so that if they are damaged or if they are destroyed, they have some kind of a record of what happened or what it used to look like. And they're a little bit, you know, heartbreakingly cynical in the in some of the comments that they made saying that, you know, if this gets destroyed, it's very unlikely we're going to rebuild it exactly the same. It's not going to come back, you know, because of the priorities of rebuilding the rest of the nation. So this may capturing some of these assets in three dimensions or in a kind of a an interactive way may be the last chance for that generation to experience um, those those relics, which is extremely sad, but it's also a great um, example of how the technology for doing this, for doing photogrammetry, for doing um, drone captures, things like that, has come to such a level that you can do that by getting in and out of there in a day. Um, you know, try doing this five years ago, it would have been, you know, weeks to capture what they've done in such detail here. And I just, I think it's a really interesting um, kind of take on not only, you know, just an amazing use case for this technology, but also how it's becoming more democratized. Maybe you don't need a $70,000 scanner to do what they're doing with a couple of cameras, um, you know, and an older scanner and, uh, and a commercial drone or a, a hobby drone because that's what they have. Um, and it's just an interesting kind of take on that. But uh, the work they're doing is absolutely beautiful. I, I hope you have a chance to just even just poke around in it. Um, so Carla, the, this company is called Skirion, S-K-E-R-I-O-N. Yes. Now, are they Ukrainian or are they from a different country? No, nope, they they're are Ukrainian. Um, they, wow. It's founded by three um, guys who all went to university together. They all studied various things and decided that they really enjoyed um, kind of the point clouds and, and mapping and GIS and things like that. They all kind of got a different specialty. Some of them were on the software side, some of them were more on the capture side. So they decided to go into business together shortly after they graduated, kind of just doing what you do when you're a reality capture company, going into buildings and, you know, producing 3D models for people. Um, and then they and then they just completely switched gears and got everybody they knew that could to help them um, to capture more of these uh, more of these heritage sites. And so for everybody out there, if you haven't checked it out, it's hashtag save Ukrainian heritage is uh, how you can find these guys and what they're doing and support them if you'd like. Uh, but Jennifer, I'd love to pick your brain for a second being a lawyer, you know, um, myself being one as well. Uh, so many law schools don't even teach uh, international humanitarian law, certainly not the law of war like the military knows. Uh, you know, I was a JAG. Um, you know, we, we kind of alluded to in the beginning, uh, this violates the law of war, this violates international law. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why cultural uh, heritage is so important to the world? Well, I'm not sure that I'm fully um, qualified to talk about that topic in depth, um, but thank you for asking me. Um, I think, uh, you know, certainly, our ability as people to relate to each other across borders is essential to our humanity um, and probably underlies a lot of the international treaties that we have. 
Um, and I, you know, and I think this work to essentially provide, you know, digital twinning, if, if I'm sort of understanding the, you know, the preservation of these heritage sites, is um, that is really fascinating. And as I was listening to Carla, I was thinking um, this kind of digital twinning of what is in the real physical world today. And putting that in the metaverse would be kind of an amazing thing um, so that we all can continue to experience what culture is like across borders um, and help to, you know, achieve better understanding of, of humans uh, one to another. You, you know, you hit the nail on the head, Jennifer, actually, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but really, <laughs> you know, when you when you look at the. The, the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict, uh, which, by the way, of course, took years to come to uh, finalization after World War II and almost the in complete destruction of Europe, not to mention, of course, Nagasaki and, Her you know, Hiroshima. Uh, so when you, when you think about that, um, you know, the, the words they use are, quote, unquote, damage to the cultural heritage of all mankind. And that really, I mean, that, those words give me chills because it just underscores the significance, not to ne necessarily one nation, you know, one group of people, the significance to all of us of these, her you know, these cultural heritage sites uh, that are now codified in not only The Hague, uh, but also kind of echoed in the 1977 additional protocols for the Geneva Conventions, the statute for Inter International Criminal Court in 1998, and the additional protocols to The Hague Convention themselves that were updated in 1999. All of this has been become part of customary international law, and this idea that you, number one, if you have cultural sites, you have a duty as a nation conflict to try to protect those. And uh, of course, if you're a belligerent on the other side of the fence, you have a duty not to deliberately target those. And of course, you know we know that a lot of these uh, sites not only get destroyed, but sometimes they just get pilfered. You know, we're still seeing today. Uh, paintings from World War II, right, that were stolen from Jewish families that are now just being returned. That's that's also an obligation. Any, uh, you know, any of these cultural artifacts, uh, there is a duty to return them. And so, you know, that's all under international law. And if you want to really nerd out or learn more about this, because I think it's such an important topic, go to the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC website. Um, they have amazing resources out there, and the ICRC is like the global watchdog uh, for all of these different treaties and international law when it comes to uh, armed conflict. Yeah, you know, Carla, when I actually came across this article before it was submitted. Normally, I'm always surprised by what the, uh, the guests bring up, but this issue specifically has been on my mind since uh, one of my uh, Muslim friends brought up uh, how much damage had been done in Syria. This was years ago he had told me about it to culturally significant sites. And essentially, you know, I, I think the thing that kind of tipped him off, I was talking about Notre Dame and how the preservation of that um, was possible because of drone flights that had been done. Um, or at least this is something that helps in the, the, the rebuilding effort is the fact that we had scans of the building in the first place. And you know, oh, Wikipedia this to this day lists 25 sites that were damaged or destroyed um, during the conflict, the main conflict in Syria. You know, it's still s somewhat ongoing, right? Uh, and those things will never come back. And it's just, it's devastating to think that you won't have those things as a reference point to teach history. You know, you might disagree with history as it progresses and we learn better ideas, uh, you know, as we evolve together, but not having the reference point to even discuss it is is a loss. It, it's it's basically like not being able to tell how much growth actually was been it had been made. Uh, when well, it was really it. crazy, Mike. You're talking like, what did you say, 20 some? Carla's article notes it's like 300 by the end as right? as of the end of May. You have some crazy statistics in there. I don't know if you want to run through them yeah. real quick. So there were at least 367 incidences of destructions to cultural sites. Um, that includes 29 museums, 133 churches, 66 theaters and libraries, and even a, a centuries-old uh, cemetery uh, for Jewish refugees. So it's just, it's heartbreaking because it, it's the same thing is that, you know, these are not coming back. 
um, you know, that no one's going to be able to build them in that same way. But I also want to just kind of mention, uh, you had mentioned the metaverse earlier. I think this, the ability to do this, um, to be able to go in and really get incredible detail of the interiors and exteriors of some of these places has never been easier to do. Um, and it's only getting easier and faster and better. And I think that there's also just a global need to accelerate the amount of um, capturing we are doing of our history because, you know, urbanization is happening very rapidly. Environmental disasters are happening more rapidly. You know, obviously the, you know, the constant threat of conflict in the world. I think that we've reached a point where, where you can even do some of this from an iPhone. I think that there's a lot of potential here to kind of accelerate the kind of almost citizen driven um, preservation of cultural artifacts across the world, you know, not just from an academic standpoint, not just from a, you know, I, I need to study this fresco on this particular wall. But if you have a digitized copy of that asset, you can share that with the whole world. The Smithsonian is doing that with all of the stuff in their collections. They're detailed 3D scanning them and then sharing them to anyone who wants to. You can, you can 3D print your own copy of anything that they have in this digitized 3D collection in the Smithsonian. And I think there's something to be said about reassembling that for other people to go to places that they've ne they'll never be able to go, right? Like I, I can't travel tomorrow inside of a Ukraine church that no longer exists, but I can pan around in that, in that gorgeous 3D model that they made and, you know, kind of have more of a rich experience to that. And I just think it's a, it's a call to action for, for a lot of um, people to start getting that done. And coming full circle back to Jennifer's article, you know, as long as you have the internet access to look at it, you know, I mean, right. so right. you can see how like, it, you know, here's yeah. the four of us all individually picking articles and, you know, without really reference to the other that there's this this connection. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm actually always amazed about how they're, 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 the episode kind of wraps up and ties together. Um, even though we, the guests randomly select their articles, that means something to me, the, to them, right? So yeah, um, yeah. It, it just Mike, goes... we skipped our thank yeah. you to our sponsors, and that was my fault. I don't know if we want to take a minute and, and do that real quick. Uh, sure, yeah. I uh, just want to take a, a quick moment to thank our sponsors. Um, we have Elsite, who is the newest sponsor. We just have uh, had Yoav Amatai on our full tilt. That's a great episode. If you could go take a look at that. Uh, <laughs> What what was the theme on that one, Don? Oh gosh, it was so long. It leading was, boldly. Uh, le it was communicating boldly, but uh, leading with um, I feel like it was leading with confidence and communicating boldly. Yep, that was it exactly. So uh, that's a great episode. Please go back and take a look at that. We also have Dragonfly, um, uh, Vodix, and the Drone Code Foundation. So we'd like to thank our sponsors for making um, the full crew and full tilt possible. And just another quick reminder. If you like what you're hearing, hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell on YouTube. Or you could go to our website and sign up on fullcrew.io uh, and never miss an episode. Uh, so our final article is actually from you, Dawn, and it is also in reference to what's going on in Ukraine in terms of defense. You've been uh, you know, picking up a lot of these kind of interesting military systems articles lately. So you want to tell us about what's going on here with uh, the vampire CUAS y systems? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, you know, UAS Vision is one of those ones that I just have dropping in my inbox every day, and it, like Drone Life and Commercial UAS News and AVS, you know, all the, all the regulars. But, you know, this one really caught my attention because, uh, again, having been military, we just love our acronyms, and this one just cracked me up. Vampire, right? It's like very attention-getting.